So uh, this is the usual thing. This has been a group effort. Uh, there's a large number of people that have made this happen. I'm played a reasonable part, but not the major part, by any stretch of the imagination. There are a number of people in this room. Uh, I see one there and a few other places, Christoph, and probably some other guys I'm missing that contributed to this. Uh, the guy that probably put the most work in it is Frederick Weisbecker. And I have to give a special tip of the hat to Thomas Gleichsner, who's the guy that convinced Frederick that he should do this for his master's thesis. So, you know. With that, um, kind of things I'm going to go through here. And at my age, of course, the first thing you do is go back to the good old days. It's just it's just a natural thing. If you aren't of this age, you'll you'll find out soon enough. Don't worry about it. You know, in the 90s, CPUs had no energy efficiency features whatsoever. In fact, in the first maybe half of the 2000s, most didn't either. I mean, there there were smartphone and cell phone CPUs that did worry about it, but the server class CPUs. Uh, actually, the idle state was the least energy efficient, the most energy used. And the reason for that was there were no cache misses, and so the ALU was kept fully busy, consuming power as much as it could. And uh, that actually meant that if you had extra scheduling clock interrupts, your system was more energy efficient rather than less. But uh, things have changed over the past uh, 10 or 20 years, and uh, right now, idle CPUs are preferably powered off CPUs. Um, and even the high-end systems tend to be pretty good, about not, not as good as the battery-powered guys, by the way. I mean, those of us in the service arena, server arena, doing the big servers, we have energy efficiency as a first-class requirement. The guys down in the battery-powered embedded range don't merely have it as a first-class requirement. For those guys, it's a fundamentalist religion. Okay? You think I'm making that up? No. Well, we'll get to that in a little while. But what happens now is you want the CPU that's idle to be powered off, and that means you don't want it to get scheduling clock interrupts unless they're really needed. Okay, and again, especially on battery powered systems. I've had guys call me up. I mean, LKMO wasn't enough for them. They, by God, called me up on the phone and screamed at me because some scheduling clock interrupts that RCU was causing was burning 40% of their battery, and they didn't like it. They were very upset, and they let me know. So, you know, you think I'm making that up? No. Anyway. Uh, this is kind of the way things are if you don't control your scheduling clock interrupts when it's idle. You'll have your clock eating up your battery, uh, causing a lot of problems. And that's not what we want. I mean, we really, really don't want that these days. Um, and if you don't believe me, put a patch in that does that and then see what phone calls you get, okay? Uh, well, this is kind of what we want instead. If the system's idle, we want it to be asleep. We don't want to be consuming power. Uh, we don't want it to be draining the battery. And we want something like that. And for idle, We've had this for a long time. Before we had Dyn Dynetic Idle, this is back to oh, early 2000s, very early 2000s. We'd have these CPUs. We have time advancing from left to right. And the vertical red bars are scheduling clock interrupts. We have CPU 0 and 1. And uh, if they go idle, well, they kind of get low power, but we still have these scheduling clock interrupts showing up. Now, modern CPUs are often really good about getting into low power really quickly. But even so, you have them spinning up and then spinning down, and that does consume energy. And uh, if you have that happening, your battery won't last very long. And that's actually kind of impolite if you think about it. I mean, would you like it if every jiffy while you're trying to sleep, somebody wakes you up? I know I wouldn't like that. So this is the way things work today if you have config no hertz enabled. You have your CPU, it goes idle, and there are no more scheduling clock interrupts. That allows the CPU to get into the lowest possible power state and stay there. And that means that you have very little CPU, uh, energy consumption, at least from the CPU. If you have a display, if you've got MS storage, other things, the network, well, you've got to worry about that separately. But I'm worried about the CPU, and this really helps with that. So this is great for energy efficiency. But uh, more recently, uh, there was cases where extra scheduling clock interrupts to user space execution were causing problems. What happens is if you have real-time application or a high-performance computing application um, and you have extra scheduling clock interrupts, it can actually really degrade the performance. For real-time, of course, you get that extra scheduling clock interrupt dur duration, the worst-case duration added to your worst-case latency. And for HPC, if you have uh, iterative computations, uh, you can end up multiplying the effects because one CPU gets slowed down and everybody else has to wait for it before you can start the next iteration. 
Uh, so there are cases where those cause problems. And the other thing is if you're running that kind of application, this heavy duty HPC computational application, you have one runnable task per CPU. I mean, you know, these guys go to lengths to make sure that the worker thread is the only thing on that CPU, interrupts, other threads, whatever, are off. And so that CPU has no job whatsoever aside from running that one thread. And that means that if we interrupt it, all we're doing is slowing things down. I mean, it's the only thread there. There's nothing else for the CPU to do, so what's the point? So what we want to do instead is if some other task shows up and we have two, then we start interrupting it. But if we're back to the point where we have just one task running on that CPU, we don't want any schedule clock interrupts. And uh, also, if you're busy, as well as if you're asleep, getting interrupted frequently isn't helpful. So we want to avoid that. All right. So what we can do is we get rid of these things. Um, and uh, an intern of mine, Josh Triplett, you know, he's now off on the doing Chromebook stuff, prototyped this in 2009. And Anton Blanchard uh, actually did some benchmarking on some HPC-style benchmarks without that fix, that red stuff shows up. In other words, we're, we're losing about 3% performance. And that may not sound like much, but if you have people that are trying to get the most out of their system, that's a big deal. Uh, with uh, Josh's patch, we end up with that. And we'll just go back and forth here. This is without his patch, this is with it. So this is really a worthwhile change. Except that there were some problems. I mean, this was just a prototype. And therefore, a user application could monopolize the CPU. If the user application started running and decided it didn't want to stop running, that was all that CPU ever did, and you, you can't have that. There was no process accounting. And for a lot of applications, who cares? But there are places where you do care, where you want to know, and it's also useful in some cases for diagnostic purposes. So we do need that. And uh, closer to home for me personally is that RC grace periods could go on forever, and uh, eventually the system runs out of memory, and that's not a good thing either. So Frederick uh, took on the task of fixing this for x86-64 and also for the core kernel code. We had some people porting it to different uh, architectures, so there's probably some more by now. And uh, it's actually in mainline now, and, uh, and you can run it. And it actually works fairly well. Uh, the top kind of is a diagram without, with just no hertz. And you see there aren't any scheduling lock interrupts, no vertical red lines above the idle part. But then you get them if the CPU is doing anything, whether it be kernel or user mode. With no hertz full, nothing happens until you get a second task awakening. All right? And uh, we do have a residual one hertz tick. You can get, there's a patch to get rid of that. Um, it's kind of a uh, uh, security blanket, I guess. Uh, we aren't sure we've taken care of everything. And so if you want to get rid of it, you can. But you have to, you're taking the responsibility of dealing with it if you've gotten rid of it, OK? But this works fairly well. And uh, as mentioned before, it's in 3.10, which has consequences. Uh, one is this enabled by default in RHEL 7. And when I first saw, heard about that, I was like, yeah, this is really cool, you know? Um, despite having more than 40 years of software development experience, that was my reaction. <laughs> I mean, you'd think I'd know better by now, but no. <laughs> Ooh, all right, you know? And that means it's used by everybody, not just by high-performance computing in real time. That means at that point, the real validation began. Because uh, I had it in my head when I started this process that the only people using this would be building their own kernels. And therefore, that it would only be used if you had serious HPC and real-time workloads. So we didn't really bother checking it out for anything else, right? Good thinking. Yeah. <laughs> right there with it. Anyway, uh, uh, Rick Van Riel helped uh, uh, get me out of that uh, state of mind. He sends me an email saying, hey, you know, I've got this uh, system. We've got more than 40% of the CPU showing up on this task called RCU SCED. Is uh, that something to do with you by any chance? And why is it doing that? <laughs> well, OK, what are you doing here? First off, we, you know, these things only do a little bit of work at the end of each grace period. So you know, 40%? What? So, okay, uh, ask him what he's doing, and he's got an 80 CPU system. That's not that big. I mean, it's big, but, you know, there are people that run 4,096 CPUs and run Linux, and maybe more by now. Um, the biggest system I've ever gotten a bug report from is 4,096 CPUs. Okay, 
All right, so 80 CPUs, what's the problem here? Well, the, the next piece was that he had a context switch heavy workload. He was running some kind of a Java application that was just context switching the whole system silly. And uh, that was not what we designed No Hertz full for, okay? That just wasn't uh, where we were focusing our effort. Well, okay, uh, sometimes you want to just go with a knee-jerk reaction, right? Sometimes you just, you know, let's, let's try this, right? And let's try this said, all right, well, maybe the grace period is just going through really, really quickly with that kind of workload. And so maybe if we just artificially slow the grace periods down, um, we can get the CPU to go down. And if that works, we can figure out what we really want to do. Unfortunately, that had no effect. Which, of course, meant I actually had to really analyze the problem and figure out what's going on. Yeah, yeah, it's really tough sometimes, you know, I don't know. So to kind of see what's going on, this is kind of a cartoony view of a little piece of RCU. So what we have in the middle there is a combining tree. And this is a scalable way of gathering data about all the CPUs and recognizing when they've all gotten to a safe state so we can say, hey, uh, everybody old stuff was done and we can let the grace period go and get on with life. So each CPU feeds in. There's actually uh, 16 CPUs by default for each of the leaf RCU node structures. I'm only showing four because I'm not that great with uh, artist here. And those run up the tree, and when you get to the top and everybody has checked in, you say, hey, we're done. And then the grace period K thread says, okay, great, uh, take care of things, set up for the next one, and go again if we need to. And if you run that way, even with this no hearse full thing set up, even with the recent kernels, everything's fine. Very low CPU consumption on that grace period K thread. So that's great. But the thing is, if you actually have the no hertz full stuff enabled and are running it, all the way. What we do is we offload the RCU callbacks. Without this, each CPU does its own callbacks. So a call, they, they schedule a callback, and we'll look at what those, what those are a little bit later. And they do their own thing. Otherwise, what happens, if you're, if you're running in the way that Rick was running his system, they get handed off to offload K threads, one per CPU. The offload K thread waits for grace period and then invokes the callbacks. If you do it that way, 40% CPU consumption. Uh, on an 80 CPU system. So what are these callbacks and why do we care? I mean, you know, if callbacks are causing problems, let's just get rid of the callbacks, right? Well, we go in a lot of detail, but for this presentation, think of it as just a way of delaying work. And so we have a per CPU data structure, and each of those things has a linked list hanging off of it, and we've got these RCU head structures. The head structures are very simple. They've got a next pointer to link the list together, and they've got a function pointer. So we record work by putting the function in one of these things saying, hey, do this sometime later. And then sometime later, we scan the list and call the function passing the address of the list element as a parameter to it. So it's just a way of doing procrastination. You know, when it's safe to do this, do this thing. And it comes along later. And the, the advantage of that is having that functionality enables very, very fast read site access to the data structures. That's why we go through all this stuff. So how does this work normally? If we aren't offloading the callbacks, what's going to happen is we have our scheduling clock interrupts and the CPU is going along doing things. And at some point, we queue a callback. OK, do this sometime later. And the hard clock interrupt, the uh, scheduling clock interrupt, notices, oh, look, everything's done right now. So invoke soft IRQ, that's the yellow bar, and invoke the callbacks. All right? So again, we're just delaying work. We couldn't do it here because it wasn't safe. It became safe sometime later, and at that later time, we did it. So what we're doing here is we're tapping the awesome power of procrastination. It's a great thing. There's one problem with procrastination, though. Sooner or later, you're going to have to do the work. This isn't like time interrupts. I mean, a timer, you know, if you post a timer, somebody might cancel it. You know, if you procrastinate, maybe you won't have to do the work at all. But with these things, once you post it, that work has to be done at some time in the future. And it will be done. You, you can't not do it. You just have to choose your time to do it. And because we do them by default in this high priority soft IRQ environment, what's happening is we've we posted the callback, uh, eventually decides that everything's OK and it invokes it. And it interrupts some poor user thread that was really important for something that, you know, it, all we're probably doing is freeing memory. We could have delayed that. We didn't need to interrupt that thing. 
but we did. Okay, and this is why we offload the callbacks. If we have a CP we know is always going to do something important, if, that's, if it's so important we shut off the scheduling clock, interrupts in user mode code, we don't want it doing RCU callbacks. Okay, or we don't want it to be doing them at high priority anyway. So that's the reason for offloading. So this is without it being offloaded, we end up interrupting ourselves in the future, possibly at a really bad time. Um, if you're just doing throughput computing, you don't care. There is no real bad time. If you're doing high performance computing or, or real time, there can be really bad times. So uh, what we do for offloading, this is something that uh, um, Jim Houston and Joe Cordy did a prototype of this in, in their own version of Linux. And it took me several years to figure out how the heck to incorporate that in the main line, which I eventually did. And uh, so it's their idea to begin with. But the idea is instead of having each CPU do its own callbacks, you have these K threads, one for each CPU. Uh, o stands for offload, RCU offload K thread. And uh, rather than having a CPU interrupt itself, it just hands it off to that K thread, and that K thread does the callback. And uh, you can do any number of things. Um, you can just have the RCU K, or K thread by default runs at normal priority. If you have real time pr uh, workload, your important work will, def will preempt the callback and make it wait until later to happen. That's one approach. Another approach that's fairly popular is to reserve a few CPUs as kind of housekeeping CPUs, as sacrificial lambs, if you will. And what you do is you just gather all those RCOK threads and force them to run on, that, on those housekeeping CPUs. And that way you're guaranteed none of that stuff's going to interrupt anybody on your important worker CPUs. So however it works for your workload, it's something that uh, the system administrator or whoever's setting up the system can make their choice. RCU doesn't care. So this is wonderful. We can, re we can eliminate disruption, but uh, you know, 40% CPU is kind of a high cost for that. And uh, furthermore, if you didn't care about disruption, 40% CPU is unconscionable. You know, if, if you wanted those CPUs to be doing some work, grabbing 40% of one may be really, really bad. And this is kind of unfortunate, because I was hoping to be able to replace the old style callback processing with the offloading. In other words, just every, everybody's offloaded all the time, but obviously that's not gonna fly, at least not yet. Not unless we can figure out some other better way of avoiding consuming so much CPU. All right, so we've got this bug coming in. Um, it's kind of late in process. So the first thing is to stop the bleeding for the innocent bystanders. In other words, figure out some way of, of working out who cares about disruption and who doesn't and make this not hurt the people that don't care about disruption. And uh, this initial bandy was fairly straightforward. Uh, we used to have it set up so that if, uh, that if uh, we saw any sign that somebody wanted no hurts full, we offloaded everybody. Just sort of like, oh, they might worry about this, we'll offload and, and just not have to worry about it. So the change instead was to offload only if the no hurts full boot parameter was set. In other words, not only was the kernel built to do offloading, or to do no hurts full, but this specific CPU was put in the mode where it wouldn't get scheduling clock interrupts. In other words, this particular CPU had been designated as an important CPU. Then and only then, we offload from it. And uh, so there's a git commit down there at the bottom that uh, takes care of that. Um, except for one slight thing. It's kind of embarrassing, but uh, industry experience is that out of every six fixes, one will introduce a new bug. And that's kind of been consistent for several decades. Um, Linus may have uh, better, more recent data, but uh, who knows. In any case, this was one of the six. <laughs> <laughs> what happened, it was a surprise to me. It turns out uh, RCU is used earlier in boot than I thought. And uh, what happens then is that, uh, you know, what happens is they register this call back and they put it, in, and at that point it doesn't know whether the CPU is special or not. And so it puts it on the non-special list. And then later on it says, oh, this CPU is special, so we'll start using the non-special list. And then that poor callback that was put on the non-special list never gets executed. Which is a problem if somebody was going to wait on it. I mean, if you're just freeing memory, so what? I mean, you've got some memory that never gets freed up. But, you know, if somebody ends up waiting if it, and that was going to wake them up, you've got a system hang. It didn't happen to me because I didn't have that set up. And it didn't happen to Rick, so his test came out just fine, but it happened to uh, Amit Shah, I think it was. Anyway, uh, so there's a simple fix. 
instead of just automatically uh, waiting until you, you have to, what we did before is waited until it was legal to create K-threads, and then and only then we made our decision. And callbacks are posted before then. So we just make the decision earlier and boot. You know, if somebody's posting callbacks before RC init, uh, what are they doing, right? So we make that decision early, and then uh, uh, that fix takes care of that, and that means we stop the bleeding caused by the previous bandage to stop the bleeding. Now it's time to fix the bug, because we still have these people that want to do offline loading, and I think 40% CPU on 80 systems, is, or excuse me, 40% of the CPU on 80 CPUs is excessive. If you don't believe me, keep in mind, I said earlier, that I've gotten bug reports in RCU from systems with 4,096 CPUs, all right? And uh, perhaps some of us get into the, you know, give 110% thing. Um, but if you do the math, if you have 4,096 CPUs, that's 4,096%, or excuse me, 2,048% of the CPU consumed by the thread to keep up. And, uh, you know, 110% gung-ho is one thing, but 2,048% is just stupid, okay? And what's going to really happen if you try that is the grace periods are just going to lag way, way behind, and it's going to, uh, you'll, you'll possibly run the machine out of memory. It's not a good thing. So um, one solution to take care of this is, say, all right, let's, uh, uh, let's, let's at least try to spread the pain out. We have this one thread that's waking up all these other threads, and that's what, that was what Rick determined by doing some profiling to be the problem to be the thing that was contributing to the excess CPU. So what we should do instead is just wake up some of the threads and then have them wake up the rest. You know, if, if you can't solve the problem, try to sweep it under the rug a little bit, right? And that's what uh, this uh, commit does. Now, the other thing that's good about it, though, is it paralyzes the wake-ups, wake and we'll see that in a moment. Uh, just to focus where we were on that previous diagram, uh, everything's the same, and what we're doing is we're, we're worrying about the interface between the grace period K thread and the offload K threads. So we're going to change the, the wake up logic there to make things run in more in parallel. And uh, also to move CPU from the top there down to the bottom, spread it out over more threads. All right, so this is how things looked beforehand. So we have this RCU, and I didn't, couldn't fit. 80 CPUs on the page, so we only got 20. Uh, you'll use your imagination for the other 60. So we've got this RCU preempt K thread, the grace period K thread, and it does a series of 20 wake ups, one after another. Okay, so that means that it takes a while. Uh, wake up takes, so oh, a couple microseconds, maybe, it depends on the system. And so if you have uh, 20 of them, that's, you know, maybe 40 microseconds. If you have 1,000 of them, that's 2 milliseconds. All right? So this isn't really very scalable in some sense. We'd like, so the hierarchy is actually kind of a good thing. And what we do is we just take and square root the number of uh, CPUs, and there happens to be an integer square root routine already in the kernel, so that was convenient. So in the case of, uh, and we round down, so we take our 20, we get 4. So we wake up 0, 5, 10, and 15 with the grace period K thread, and they wake up their own group. So that means that this guy is only doing 4 wake-ups instead of 20. That means if we have a huge machine, um, the number of wake-ups rises by the square root, so it's a reasonable number even with thousands of CPUs. And it means these guys run in parallel. So we can get everybody woken up in parallel and, and have reasonable response time to the end of the grace period. Interestingly enough, I mean, all I was trying to do was sweep stuff under the rug. And by accident, I got rid of some of it. Sometimes you get lucky, you know? <laughs> Sometimes it works. If we have a busy system, and that was what Rick was having. He had this system that was doing job and constantly switching itself to death and sending callbacks all over the place. Um, and in that case, each CPU is going to post an RCU callback every grace period. So every time, RCU is going to have something to do on each CPU all the time. And the old way of doing that, what happened is that each of the RCU uh, offload K threads is going to be woken up when it gets its first callback. The guy does, okay, call RCU, here's a callback. And says, oh, is this guy running? No, he isn't. Okay, wake him up. Okay, so each, each of these offload K threads gets one wake up per grace period when it gets its first callback for that grace period. And then what happens is that they all say, great, I need a, I need a grace period. So R2 does its thing, and then the, then the grace period K3 goes and wakes them all up. So each of these K threads gets waken up twice. So we have a total of 80, uh, um, 40 wake ups for our 20 
K threads, it would be 160 for the 80 that Rick had. And those are two per K thread, and 20 of those, half of them, are done by the grace period K thread. Okay, if we do it the new way, what happens is that 0, 5, 10, and 15 are awakened when their first callback is posted. And that's not just their callback, it's theirs or any of their followers. So if CPU 3 suddenly says, hey, I got a callback, he'll wake up the 0 K thread. And then what's going to happen is that each of the K threads is awakened at the grace period ends. Um, and the, those four are going to be awakened by the grace period K thread, and the remainder are going to be awakened by their corresponding offload K thread. And that means we only have 24 wake ups. Because we didn't have to wake up the other 16 offload K threads when their callback showed up. What happens is the leader got awakened for them. And that means we had a 40% reduction in total wakeups and an 80% reduction in the number of wakeups that the Grace Bird K thread did. It went down from 20 of them down to 4, and we went down from 40 total to 24 total. All right, so you can see, again, going back to this diagram, what's happening here. Uh, the top guys, top four, are being awakened when their callback is posted. The bottom 16 are not, because the top one gets awakened on their behalf. And then uh, everybody gets awakened uh, when the grace period ends. Uh, the grace period K thread wakes the top four, and each of those top four awaken the four underneath them. All right, so we spread things out, and by luck, we reduced it a little bit. And as you add more CPUs, it gets better. This is a plot. Um, the, we got a percent reduction in the wake-ups. Uh, and then on the bottom, we got the number of CPUs. I went at 512. And you can see the number done by the grace period K thread is reduced by, uh, when you get to 80 CPUs, it's being reduced by somewhere between 80 and 90 percent. So it's a pretty large reduction. And the total is being reduced by over 40 percent. And as you get larger, the reduction approaches one half, 50 percent reduction. So you know, this is actually saving a fair amount. There is a one dark side to this, of course. And that is that the four offload K threads at the top, the ones that had to do all the work and wake up their followers, they're going to see an increase in wake ups. Um, and we expect if we kind of uh, extrapolate from Rick's setup, we'd expect that we had 512 CPUs, we'd have a little over 10% CPU utilization on each of those. And there'd be, what, uh, uh, nine of them in his case, or eight of them, excuse me. Um, and they'd all be seeing about 10 or 11% CPU utilization. But only if you had a really serious context switch heavy over, uh, workload and you were running, and you had designated that, all the CPUs as being worker CPUs that were not supposed to be interrupted. If you just booted normally and didn't have any of that, you'd be using the old method of callback invocation and you wouldn't see any of this overhead. If you did designate a bunch of CPUs as being worker CPUs and did it the way that we intended, which is you have a lot of CPU bound stuff where you have occasional uh, real-time workloads, then again, you wouldn't see much traffic in RCU and your, your CPU utilizations would be quite low. But even if you're using it improperly, it's not too bad, even with large numbers of CPUs. So at some point, if we have really big systems um, and people, for some reason, run lots of really heavy-duty context switch workloads on, in this configuration, and, and that might happen. I mean, you might have some workload where you go and you do some heavy-duty HPC for 10 seconds, and then you spend a second doing some stupid thing that does a lot of context switches, and then you go back to doing heavy-duty HPC. I mean, so I can't admit, I, I don't know why anybody do that, but, you know, I've been around for a long time, and there have been a lot of things that happen that I would have never imagined, so, you know, there's some chance this will, and if it does, we add another level of hierarchy. Instead of, you know, having leaders and followers, we'll have leaders and leaders of followers and follower of followers or something. But you know something? I bet that we'll have a lot of other problems and the kernel will show up first if we do something that does huge amounts of context switches on 500 CPUs. Anyway, uh, so looks pretty good. Um, not only we spread out the workload, we reduced it. You know, sometimes you get lucky again. And uh, the systems with lots of CPUs aren't likely, at least they don't now, run these heavy duty context switch workloads. So what's not to like? Well, yeah, um, <laughs> you guys know the drill. <laughs> uh, your, your stats are so far six out of six, right? Or at least two out of three. <laughs> I said it was the energy of Andrew average. I didn't say it was any good. <laughs> you apparently are better than Andrew. That's right. Overachieving. <laughs>
And actually, the thing is, is that, uh, well, I'll, I'll cover this a little later. That, there's a the lesson hangs off of that interchange, and we'll, we'll hit it in a later slide. Okay, um, anyway, what happened is that uh, Amit Shah uh, was reporting system hangs during boot. I wasn't seeing any. Rick wasn't seeing any. You know. <laughs> anyway, uh, a guy named Pranath Kumar uh, actually chased it down. Really good, really good effort and got things going, and he actually produced the fix as well. And the problem was, in certain configurations, in certain situations, uh, you would start the leader K thread, and if it happened to have a callback and just the right stuff was set up, it just would never process it, you'd have to give it another callback before it would start. And if the first callback was something that the whole system was waiting to get done, it just would never happen, okay? So you could sometimes, if things were just right, get a system hang. And uh, the fix is that you just <laughs> pretend you, when you first show up, you pretend you got told you have a callback even if you don't and then get things started and life is good. Well, <laughs> uh, you guys got the idea. So Paul Gortmager calls me IRC and says, you know, why have I got so many RCU key threads? I can't remember if they had eight or 16 CPUs, but uh, whichever it was, he had like 240 of these things, which is a bit excessive given that you're only supposed to have like either two or three per CPU. So even if he had 16, that'd be like 48 at most. Well, it seems that, uh, um, seems that uh, all sorts of things, people in, in, in computers like to lie. And there's firmware that likes to lie about the number of CPUs on the system. It likes to exaggerate. So his firmware was saying, yeah, I got like, you know, 80 CPUs. And RCU was stupid enough to believe it. Oh, you got 80 CPUs? Okay, 240K threads, no problem. And of course, these things just sat idle, uh, which isn't too bad, but they were consuming a lot of PS overhead. And you know, if you do PS, you see all these things. And if you were on a, on a tight memory machine, although if you had a tight memory machine, maybe you should code your firmware more carefully, but, but whatever. Um, if you had a tight memory machine, they'd be using a memory that could be better used for purposes. But this is pretty easy to deal with. Um, you just don't create K threads until the CPU comes online, right? So if the firmware says the CPU, say, okay, I'll take your word for it for right now. And then when the CPU actually comes online, then you create the K threads, all right? And that means that, you know, if you, if you uh, have some, CPU, some bit of firmware that says I've got 80 CPUs and it's really not three, you'll only see the three come online and say, okay, nine K threads, you're done. We had to do a little, I had a little work here. The first commit uh, kind of refactors the sp thread spawning a little bit, and then I was able to do something that creates them only for online CPUs. And this worked great, worked great for Paul, worked great for me, you know. But I think you guys know the drill by now. <laughs> the only reason it passed the test was that neither Paul or I had modules enabled. And plus, even if I had modules enabled, my firmware doesn't lie about the number of CPUs. And it turns out uh, that module removal often uses something called RCU barrier. All right, and so you know, what the heck is RCU barrier? Well, suppose you have, the, you, you're, you have this kernel module, and the kernel module uses a call RCU. So it's saying, okay, here's this function I want you to call sometime later. Uh, it's one of my functions in my module, and you know, when it's safe, call it. And what that means is this, uh, call it my func, this function is going to be called sometime later, and if uh, RCU is really, really busy on the CPU that happened to have that callback, it might be a long time later because, you know, a grace period takes a certain period of time, and if you've got 10,000 callbacks, which, by the way, is not impossible. I've seen it. I, I, I have special handling in RCU for if a CPU suddenly gets 10,000 callbacks, and it does happen sometimes, um, then it's going to maybe a good long time after that grace period ends before your callback finally gets invoked. And, in fact, it can be long enough that somebody might have removed the module in the meantime. All right? If that happens, uh, your MyFunk is out of memory, and when it tries to call that, nothing good is going to happen. Uh, this can be embarrassing and somewhat uh, fatal surprises. This has been around for a long time. Uh, RCU Barrier went in, I don't know, 10 years ago or something like that uh, because of things like this. And uh, the, what it does to prevent it is that it waits for all the previous callbacks to be invoked. All right? And so what we do when we have that uh, is that uh, we, we have the kernel module do is call RCU, and it might be invoked a long time. At CPU may be busy, it may be invoked a long time later. We don't know when. But uh, we unload the kernel module, and that kernel module does RCU barrier. And that RCU barrier waits for all the callbacks that have been previously registered to get invoked. 
with including the callback that's going to call my func. And then and only then we unload the module and that's okay because all the callbacks are done and it's no problem. And there's two things that make this work. One is that what RCU Barrier does is it posts a callback on all the CPUs that have callbacks and it waits for all of them to be invoked. The other thing is that RCU very carefully makes sure that it invokes the callbacks from a given CPU in order. Okay? And because we do that, you can just post those callbacks, wait for them all to get done, and, and then you're fine. This is kind of some pseudocode about how this happens. You do get online CPUs because if CPUs come and go while you're doing this, you can get really confused. You set a counter to one because you want to avoid some races. And for each online CPU, if that CPU has callbacks, you post another callback to it. If it doesn't have callbacks, ignore it, no problem. Because you only have to wait for the callbacks, not for the not callbacks. And then what the callback does is it atomically decrements that counter, the one we set to one, and if it's zero, it wakes us up. Then we put online CPUs. We've got everybody set up. If they want to bring CPUs on and off after that, no problem. We atomically decrement the counter, which avoids races and uh, callbacks and more online CPUs being closed. And then we just wait for that counter to reach zero. The problem is, if we have CPU offloading, we're sending these K threads. Those callbacks might be around a long time after the CPU goes offline. Because what's happened is we've said, okay, he, you, K thread, here's a callback. That K thread might be blocked by high priority stuff or just being busy or whatever. And the CPU can go offline and that callback's still there. We still have to wait for it. So if we have an offloaded CPU, we have to give it a callback anyway, even if it's offline because it might have some delayed callback still there. Because just because it's offline, it's kthread still there. Unfortunately, um, in this new world where we try to deal with firmware lying to us, the CPUs that are never online don't have kthreads, don't have offload kthreads. And that means if we post a callback to them because they've been offloaded, that callback's never gonna be executed which means that our two barriers are never going to come back, which uh, is not what we want. And anyway, this is a fairly easy change. Uh, we add to a condition that, by the way, the CPU that's offloaded also has to have an RCU, uh, have to have a, a K thread already. We have to have created that K thread, and then and only then we give a callback to it. So um, yet another commit to take care of that. And uh, this one I actually found by inspection. I started getting a little paranoid by, by this time. It's one of these things where you kind of have this reflex action. There's a bug. Okay, I can fix it here. And then you forget about, yeah, there's other consequence over there, like an RCU barrier. And uh, by the time I got to this point, it's like, okay, fine. I'm going through all this code. I'm going to see what the heck's going on so that, because uh, I'm getting tired of this stuff popping up at odd intervals. And uh, by inspection, I found this thing. Uh, what happened is that uh, uh, the leader follower lists uh, work just great if the CPUs come online in order. If they come online out of order, then uh, you can lose followers, and, and those followers' callbacks never get processed. So at that point, I said, all right, fine, we're taking this code, we're putting it in user mode, and we're making an exhaustive test for the whole thing, uh, which I should have done to start with, by the way. Uh, and uh, anyway, coming back to some of the lessons we learned, one of the things you want to do is limit the scope of changes. Had we stopped to consider that no hertz full would be used on any workload at any time by anybody, um, rather than assuming that, oh, if you want to use this, you recompile your kernel to enable this Kagenvig parameter, which is where we were naively sitting, uh, you want to make sure that you don't put innocent bystanders at risk. If there's somebody not needing your feature, make sure it's disabled or otherwise rendered harmless. The other thing is that Linux has a rather amazing range of workloads and, and hardware. And there's no way you're going to test everything because there's just too much to test. And so that puts more emphasis on the first part. Because you don't know what's going on all the time, make sure that you affect only the stuff you need to affect. Try to do, do no harm where you're not needed. Of course, as you might have noticed through this presentation, fixes can generate additional bugs. In fact, there's a guy that said Murphy that says they will generate additional bugs. And there's another guy that says Murphy's an optimist. And that's the guy I agree with. Uh, 
Well, sometimes you get lucky, as I did on the one fix where I save CPU time instead of just shoveling it in a corner. But the big thing with all of this, all these bugs, the original bugs, weren't that big of a deal. Okay, I mean, 40% CPU consumption is embarrassing, but doesn't crash the system. Having extra RCU K thread, oh, go K threads, RCU offload K threads, it's kind of embarrassing, it's kind of annoying, but it doesn't crash the system. So if you have bugs that are minor or very restricted in their, in their nature, you need to be more careful about validating the fixes. I mean, if you've got a deterministic boot time panic, I mean, there's not much you can do to make that worse. I mean, sure, you could put something in there that bricks the system, too, just to be on the safe side, but, but uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, things, no matter how bad it is, things can always be worse, all right? But, but still, the odds of that are somewhat lower. If, you have, if it's happening really bad, a random change is likely to make it, just as likely to make it better as to make it worse. If things are slightly bad, a random change is going to make it worse. And so uh, what we should have done was, what I should have done is be much more measured about my fixing the bugs. You know, it was kind of, I felt really bad. I, this stuff was out in the distros and I had this stuff screwed up, so let's fix it right now, right? That's, yeah, sometimes you need to be a little more measured. And this is why we have lots of rules about what sort of stuff is accepted when, in case those have been irritating you at various times. Um, people probably trust me more than they should, but uh, this experience may well have fixed that problem. <laughs> The other thing is it's not enough to check your assumptions. You see, if you have an assumption that you've held for a long time, like, you know, if somebody's using this feature, they built their own kernel, you build these towers of logic on top of it. And then you've probably adopted processes based on that logic. And then you've probably formed habits based on those processes. All right? And if you invalidate the assumption, you've got to work your way through back all of that stuff. And of course, the hardest thing is you've got to change your habits that are wrong because you had a bad assumption behind them. And, uh, uh, this is not something that you, you can say, oh, well, that, function, that assumption doesn't matter anymore, but there's a lot of work beyond that to actually avoid implicitly making that assumption even when you know it's wrong, as was the case with the build their own kernel thing. So anyway, my, uh, if I had been going through that, when I saw that it was going into rel 7, I would have panicked and started, started hitting validation and screaming at other people to validate, and we probably would have at least found the problems earlier. Uh, eventually, we did find the problems, and I think it wasn't that big of a deal. As, not as bad as it could have been, but that's not saying much. But uh, you do have to be careful. Next slide, just some additional things going on with uh, bare metal um, and some more information. If you're using it and want to do configuration, cheat seats, so these slides will be posted. You can look at them later. And uh, booting and so on, and uh, you know, summary about... Uh, uh, helping to make Linux work better for more extreme computing. And of course, uh, the obligatory slide sponsored by IBM Legal. Uh, I don't know if we have time for a question or two. Okay. If uh, people have questions, be happy to take them. Slightly double barreled one. Um, what first of all, the easy one, what happened to the user land test? Like, does that go into a test suite somewhere? What happened? So, um, so why didn't user land test suites catch this? Oh, no, no. You so, sorry, the new one that you wrote, what oh, happened to it? Uh, it's sitting there on my laptop. Um, it's not a regression test. Um, you have to, like, know RCU and rip pieces of it out and kind of drop it into this file and then run this thing and see what comes out. So it's, I mean, um, uh, so... Uh, No, it's, uh, it's a design test uh, or, a, or an implementation test rather than a regression test. Um, if it kept causing problems over and over again, I might script it, put some comments in or something, and script removing and putting in there and run it as part of my regression test suite, but uh, it'll have to break a few more times before I, before I take that on. <laughs> You're young, you need the exercise. You can handle it. Uh, Paul, in slide 45, you say other Linux scalability issues will strike first. Can you describe a few of them? This one? Yes. Uh, so the question was, what kind of issues? Which are the scalability, Which are the scalability oh. issues that you mentioned? There? Oh, um, well, I don't know for sure. But uh, I'm betting that some part of the kernel will, if, if you have 512 CPUs and you have a uh, workload that's context switching every 200 microseconds on each CPU, I'm pretty sure that there are some parts of Linux that will protest rather vigorously about that treatment. I don't know what they are yet, but 
But, you know, and I might be wrong. It could be that I get hammered and nobody else does, in which case, well, I'll fix the bug, right? Yeah, if there are no more questions, thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, hopefully this helps some people out. And have a great rest of the conference.